Hey, hey, thank you so much for joining another episode of Celeste the Therapist Podcast. My name is Celeste. I'm a therapist from Boston. I come on, I talk to people who are doing things to empower the lives of others. I do that because I realize it helps people shift the way they think. Today, we are joined by Romney Malco. He is an actor and he currently stars in a hit show, A Million Little Things, that's currently running on ABC. He also directed and starred and produced his own movie called Tijuana Jackson. Purpose Over Prison, a really good movie you can watch right now in the comfort of your own home. Uh, And we talked about this idea of challenging your inner critic. He shares how he was able to do that. We also talked a little bit about the People's Empowerment Platform. It is a pager app he created so that you can have access to your favorite person's uh, social media platform, and I am currently on the PEP. You can get the PEP. It's free if you are a creator, an influencer, an actor, a business owner, and you struggle with getting people to see your content on social media. I suggest that you download the PEP, and there's going to be a clip of him talking about the PEP. And right after that clip, we're going to go straight into the episode. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with somebody that you love. If you are listening to me on Apple Podcasts and you have not rated me yet, what are you doing? Can you rate me right now? All you got to do is give me a five star. It will help push my podcast up on the mental health charts. You can also follow me on all social media platforms. Go to CelesteTherapist.com to learn more about me. Let's get into this amazing episode. I want everyone to do me a favor. Go to Pep Pager Lite. That's oh, L-I-T-E in Google Play in the App Store. Pep Pager Lite. Follow me on the Pep. And I'm going to tell you why, because I get so many people complaining that they're not getting notifications when I go live or when I post a video or whatever the case is. I decided I would just notify myself. So I created a notification app called the PEP. If you, It's called PEP Pager Lite, L-I-T-E. If you want to see what a, what a black man's app looks like, go to Google Play or the App Store and download it. Follow me on there. And you'll get notifications when I'm going live. You get notifications when I give stuff away. You'll get notifications when I so like uh, post videos. Oh, this is this is my page. If you go there, you can find my page. Yay, yes. Oh. Cool thing about the PEP is text messaging and emails are invasive. That's why people give you fake email addresses. Having the PEP, it's called a PEP pager light because it's just a pager. Literally, you just receive a, note, a buzz and it's like, oh, look, Celeste posted something. Let me see what it is. Takes you directly to the post. And when I'm done with the post, I make my comment or whatever. And I go right back into the app and proceed to see what other notifications I have. Bam, just like that. 365 days, but I treat every day like it's my last. I'm only concerned with building on the future because I can't change my past. Positive vibes for positive lives. She just giving you that truth and shifting your mind. It's more mental than you realize. It's up to you to take control. Cause this world is cold and negativity gon' take its toll. Now we've been told any day could be your last. I'm embracing every moment and I cherish every laugh. Every smile, every hug, every kiss, every touch. Every person in my life that I care about and love. But wait. Maybe I'm getting too emotional. Maybe. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Why? Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain. Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right. So this a moment of clarity. Be clear. And make sure you always protect your energy. Yeah. You stay focused and your life gon' be lit. And you are now rocking with Celeste the Therapist. Let's go. Hello, everyone. My name is Romney Malco. I'm an actor. I've been acting for 20 years. And you might know me from movies like Think Like a Man, Baby Mama, 40 Year Old Virgin, shows like Weeds, A Million Little Things, which I'm actually filming right now. And more importantly, my directorial debut, Tijuana Jackson, Purpose Over Prison. If you haven't seen it yet, you like an indie film with some really dark, twisted, yet insightful humor, Check out TijuanaJackson.com. It's all there. So if anybody doesn't know, the re- the way I met Romney was through the film that he's doing now when he was doing the pilot for it. Uh, someone had shared a broadcast that I did on Periscope and, and you were learning more about depression because the character you play is a depressed male. So that's how we kind of connected, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I actually, I think I had seen you on Periscope and I was like, oh, I like you. You're keeping it raw. I remember you were talking about something about relationships and like the disciplines of not acting on your triggers. And I just started laughing when you were talking because it was so straight out the kitchen. I don't know any other way. What else? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You get a lot of props for that. And I I started sharing your stuff right away. (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. 
Today, I want to talk about the inner critic. If anybody's not following Romney on YouTube, definitely follow him. He goes live pretty frequently, uh, and he's very transparent. And one of the things he's talked about is a lot of the trials and tribulations that he's gone through and how he's been able to overcome it. Why is it that you find yourself doing this for people? Because you don't have to do what you do. You know, growing up, I realized quickly that by being really transparent, you, you know, you grow up afraid of being shamed for certain things. Mm -hmm. But the minute I slipped up and became transparent as a kid, I saw how it actually liberated other people to talk, to open up, to share their experiences. And in that process, I realized that it was actually quite a relief to be like, damn, I'm not the only one going through this. Damn. You know what I mean? There's a lot of folks going through it and get insights on what other people had been through and what they had done. In some instances, it made me extremely grateful for my circumstances because you learn of people who are going through problems that might take precedence over whatever it is you think you're going through at the moment. Not that, I mean, it's all relative, but I just mean, it just helped me see how important it was to, to open up to people and allow them to open and trust that they too will open up. Now, everybody's not responsible with other people's emotions. And so of course there are people who are gonna like try to make fun of you or shame you for those things but usually those are the people with the biggest problems and so either way you are being of service because you either aid in exposing them or you aid in opening up the conversation and so one of the most rewarding things i ever did was 10 years ago went online as a character named tijuana jackson ex-convict turned motivational speaker and did this online course called prison logic and that was transformational for me and a lot of people within two episodes the new york times was did a full page write up on the character people were calling in to speak about experiences that they had had in their lives ranging from anywhere from like verbal abuse to molestation and i was in character receiving this information and speaking with people and the way that in which people responded to the character made me realize that it was something that was very needed. And I'm happy that here we are 10 years later and mental health is becoming like a mainstream topic and that it's okay and it's no longer, it no longer has that stigma and people from our communities are talking about it. But for me, nothing has been more rewarding in the last 10 years of my life than opening up that dialogue. The way you are now, you know, what you do, I think it's easy for somebody to look at what where you are in life and um, you know say like if only I had what you had maybe mm -hmm. I can do some of the things I want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think people like kind of struggle with that comparison piece? Because like if I if I look at you now, I'm, I'm right now comparing your highlighted reel, but because mm -hmm. I've been rocking with you for a while, I know that you didn't start where you're at now. Why do you think people do that? I think that particularly in our country, the way in which our media is structured and the way in which we are conditioned to interpret the world and interpret life, the places in which we seek our information consciously or subconsciously condition us to look at things from a very binary perspective. You're either rich or poor, good or bad, you're a virgin or a whore. We have good guys and bad guys, and we kind of approach life like that. And sadly, the shortcoming of that is, is that we never really, we rarely take an opportunity to experience the gray. And the truth is, is that the gray is pretty much the process. If we took time to experience the gray, we'd have more compassion for the person who was doing less off than us because we would have spent a little bit of time considering what might have led that person to that point. Or if we took more time to consider the gray, we wouldn't idolize people as much or judge people for being successful because we would have spent a bit more time understanding and empathizing with that process. And so I just think that just as a civilization, one of the reasons we're in the condition that we're in now and the reason that we do take those kind of shortcuts when we uh, look at people is because we've just been conditioned to be binary thinkers. And then when I think about the gray part, the parts where are different, part of the struggle I think we have is the voice in our head, right? There's this, this noise in our head that comes from the experiences that we've had, the doors that have been closed. And I found that when we don't process what happens, it starts to process on its own and it creates its own narrative. Um, and this is something that you talked about recently about this inner critic. Can you mm -hmm. talk to people a little bit about that and kind of like what you've learned through your experiences and your <laughs> expert 
Uh, he's an, I think you're an avid <laughs> learner, Rami. <laughs> I, I I don't know. I will tell you that when it comes to this stuff, I am because I've had such a transformation in my life. I'm coming from such extreme dysfunction, having such a very unique upbringing and have feeling at a point where the, inter the negative internal dialogue, that critical inner voice, I could not shut it down. And it was on the verge, I feel like on the verge of maybe driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. and or leading to real mental illness is what I should say. Mm -hmm. And experiencing that transformation, I'm still 20 years later like, yo, y'all see that? <laughs> you know, like it feels I so it's so dramatically different in the way in which I interpret the world, the way in which I process stress, my breathing patterns. It's just so dramatically different. So I'm still fascinated by it. So I do spend a lot of time trying to learn about it, but I will just I just want to tell people in regards to uh, the, the critical inner voice that Celeste was referring to. Um, Celeste is talking about the, this quiet voice that we often hear in moments when we're being challenged or we feel as though we're on the verge of failure or in periods of discomfort or just in moments of silence or where we're feeling disappointed about ourselves. There's a voice, there's a critical inner voice that comes in to try and convince you of not being worthy, not being good enough, not being qualified, not being worthy of what? Not being worthy of love, not being worthy of employment, not being worthy of wealth, you know, those types of things. And from my personal experience, this critical inner voice doesn't necessarily formulate from words. It can formulate from energy and attitude. And so I'll give you a prime example. You have a child and the child is making choices different from what a teenager who's making choices different from what you'd like. And so you get, you have this air of disappointment in you and you might not say anything, but the way in which you address the child, the way in which you look at this 17 year old begins to create a tone. That form of interpretation becomes that teenager's way in which they regard themselves. They say that when you abuse a child, that the child doesn't hate the parent, the child learns to hate themselves. And that's kind of where a lot of our negative internal dialogue comes from. The other part of it is that, I don't know about you, but I grew up in a lot of environments where people really pride themselves on being able to make fun of people, shame people, belittle people for their flaws and for their setbacks. And to be honest with you, I'm in an industry where a lot of people look at that as entertainment. And so there's a huge portion of our culture and when I say our culture, I'm not really referring to race. I'm talking about American culture that finds observing people being made fun of and, and comedy at the expense of others or entertainment at the expense of others, find it as being entertaining and, and, and fun to observe. But sadly, those things also contribute to a huge civilization of people who have all of this negative internal dialogue and this fear of acting out or pursuing their dreams because they may be the next target. And then when it comes to this drastic change you made, because I, I love talking about change, but I'm very realistic about it and know that it's not a, a one time. It's not like I'm going to sit down and say, like, I need to make this change. I realize that there's this journey that takes place. Tell people a little bit about what you've been able to do to help not allow that. And because I still I have an inner critic, I have an imposter syndrome, right? That you know I'm in a place where I've never been before. I'm, you know what I do now is not something that I've seen people in my personal life uh, experience. So what do you do to help yourself push out of that zone? Look at Celeste, all professional, Shut up. You're so all studious. Extra, extra oh, cute now. Podcast. Like, <laughs> kudos, kudos. I like it. I like it a it's lot. Let me get my microphone. Rami, you got it. You gave me my character. Come on, I gotta do this. Come on, this is a real interview now. No, this is all admiration. This is all admiration and love. Yeah, you know that's interesting. And the the process. I think that the first thing I. I think one of the best things I could say to start this whole thing off with is that, you know, it really just boils down to being able to identify your critical inner voice. Just simply being able to be like, whoa, what is that? And if you have to give it a name, give that critical inner voice a name even. Oh, okay. Here comes negative Nate or whatever the hell you call it. But simply by being able to identify it, you are able to differentiate yourself from it. 
And that's a huge step. In fact, I didn't come up with that. Uh, uh, there's a doctor by the name of Dr. Fire. I believe her name is Dr. Firestone. She's a psychologist as well. Yeah, but Dr. Firestone is what I believe her name is. And she was saying that if you can simply identify that critical, yeah, her name is Lisa Firestone. That's it. She has a book titled Dealing with That Critical Inner Voice. That's what it's called. And Dr. Firestone was saying how if you're able to identify that voice, you can then separate yourself from it. And simply by separating yourself from it, you're able to hear it a bit more objectively. And to be quite frank, I didn't know about Dr. Firestone back in the day, but that's exactly what I did. I remember having a conversation with myself, be like, I don't talk to anyone in the world like this. Or do I? What is this voice? Whatever this voice is, I don't like it. And that's what's crazy is that a lot of times what you'll see is that critical inner voice that you're hearing is the way in which you interpret the world. I'm about to say something that's going to sound so far-fetched but and sound so off topic, but, I, but I'm going to, I'll reserve it so that Celeste can continue to guide this interview and then I'll bring it back up. But I would just say that the first thing it starts with mindfulness and mindfulness is just being a lot more aware of the, the power of your words and the power of the words you allow into your psyche and then being using that mindfulness to identify this critical inner voice when it, you know, when it presents itself and then being able to separate yourself from it. What was the far-fetched thing you were going to say? I was, I was going to basically tell you that, listen, we're all quite judgmental. We can be quite judgmental. Some of us really feel the need to judge. And I believe that a lot of times judgment comes from a need. It's a method of survival. You're trying to assess your environment and the people within it because you may feel that a certain person may be a threat or may impose beliefs on you that you don't necessarily to, to be sucked into. And so uh, this need to judge is just a human trait. The problem with judgment, particularly critical judgment, is that it is a double-edged sword. So what that means is the way in which you view the world, the, the more harsh of a critic you are towards the world, the more harsh of a critic you believe the world is towards you. Yeah. We're not, we're not cameras. We don't get to swap lenses, look at the world one way, then boom, let me, let me put this lens on and look at myself differently. No, our, the way we look at things, our outward perspective, uh, the way in which we impose judgment and, and criticism is exactly how we believe. And, it is being done to us. And one of the quickest things I could do to change that for myself was relinquishing the need to control. And I, you ain't got to go too far, but if you just reduce your expectations of others by just about 99%, <laughs> you, you will have embarked upon Happiness Island. You'll be a hell of a lot happy. I can guarantee you that. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Relinquishing the need to control. So that's what I was going to say is that uh, quite often the way in which you speak to yourself is more than likely the way in which you, you speak to others or think of others. And as you become more mindful and you understand the psychological damage, the psychological effects that it has on others and you, I, I'll give you a prime example. I do a character named Tijuana Jackson, ex-convict turned motivational speaker. And he'll be saying things like, you know, and he doesn't mean anything by it, but he'll he'll have a cigarette and be like, you know, we got this thing in prison called the peekaboo. What it is is when you really want to humiliate a motherfucker, you push your dick between your legs, make him blow you from the back. This way, when you come, you can shit in his face. And, and he doesn't realize how uncomfortable that is and how that does not, how... The, the etiquette is not, he, the lack of etiquette that he's demonstrating in saying things in, in certain settings because he's so conditioned to being in prison, right? So he's actually so institutionalized and blind to the ways in which his actions and words may affect the rest of the world. And so he, he's lacking, his mind... His, his mindfulness is compromised. He's not as he's not as mindful as he could be, and a lot of us are like that in more subtle ways. <clears throat> we don't understand that that's that that need to criticize, that need to undercut, that need to poke and jab, or the way in which we interpret confrontation as a form of strength. We're not even aware that that we're not being mindful, and that we're not aware of the effects that it's having on others and us. Yeah. And so, as we make an attempt to become more mindful, we begin to understand a better etiquette for how we communicate with ourselves and how we communicate with others, particularly our children. Yes. 
And, uh, you know, when I did this uh, survey around people, if they are their biggest uh, critic, 81% said yes. That's yeah. more than half of people that said that yeah. they're, they're their biggest critic. I mm -hmm. feel like that's a problem because it stops us from living out our purpose. And mm -hmm. uh, speaking of purpose, if you haven't heard a podcast we did two years ago, Living a Life of Purpose, Rami and I kind of dissected and talked about how important it is to kind of understand your purpose. Can you just tell people why do you think purpose is important? First of all, I think that purpose is a human trait. But if you've ever read the book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, Dr. Viktor Frankl, you begin to understand that the truth is, is that man thrives on community. We, th we Man and woman, we are here. We serve in community. And, and we are happiest when we are able to identify our role within that community. And um, as we, as a civilization and in the capitalist society uh, c uh, continue to evolve, we become more and more individualistic. It's disconnected us from that sense of community. It's disconnected us from that sense of purpose. So what is this sense of purpose? This sense of purpose, it helps to define you. It helps you, helps give you a method for being of service. And why is being of service so important? Because being of service is a huge portion of a huge part of what leads a man to feeling accomplished, successful, and gives him that sense of belonging or gives her that sense of belonging is fulfilling a purpose uh, on behalf of or in, or in service to his or her community. And the way in which we've been conditioned, again, I was talking earlier about our indoctrination and the way in which we uh, our orientation into life based on media and uh, our textbooks and um, peer pressure is that we were taught that it was all about making money and we basically took on corporate values as individuals. And here we are with a whole bunch of money and yet some of our wealthiest people are being exposed for the most heinous scandals and fulfillment seems to be so far out of reach. And it's because of the fact that we tribal human tribal beings out by the way before we came along there were like seven or eight other actually it might have been 14 different species of humans and we're the ones who sustained but what all of those species had in common were that they were tribal and we have gotten out of touch with the fact that we are a tribal being and need to be a part of a community and need to be a service of the community so that's why purpose is important Yes, it is. And, you know, as you said earlier, you know, how our culture, like American culture, tries to kind of fit us in a box. And there's these gray spots that we're not entertaining. Uh, and a lot of people, unfortunately, don't get a chance to walk into their purpose. I say there's a lot of dreams in the graveyard uh, because that inner critic uh, continues to knock. You're not mindful of it. And because you're not mindful of it, you don't move forward with the way that, you know, I think we get uncomfortable. We're not, we're not doing the things that we're capable of, you know, mm -hmm. when we live yeah. below stand, I really believe that our mind and body knows that we're capable of so much more. And we start yeah. to get really uncomfortable. I think, I think that's interesting. Yeah. You know, and the funny thing is, is that I think that people give, they put too much weight on discomfort. You know, I was in the Marine Corps. And one thing that I learned quickly in boot camp, I couldn't have been there more than I learned this within you know, boot camp's a process, but by the time you get to boot camp and they and they bring you in with all the poop with all the new people and they sit you down and they start shaving your head, they put you in camouflage pants and you're sitting there in front of them, they start testing you psychologically. And one of the first things I learned almost immediately was I have to shut off and become comfortable with discomfort. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm not I'm not gonna make it through this. And I gotta tell you that um as I've gotten older and it's been 30 years. 35 years, yeah, it seems like the most successful people I know all share the same mantra. You have to get comfortable with discomfort. That's that. If, if there are like secret keys to fulfillment, I would say that getting comfortable with discomfort and honoring purpose would be two of those keys. Yeah, that's good. And I, people, they was like, oh, I wish I could just do what you did, what I've done. And, you know, I started off going on YouTube, then Periscope, then the podcast, well, the book, then the podcast and people, uh, and I say, you, you can do it too. It's not, there's nothing so special about me other than the fact that I push past the fear. Everything that I've done, 
I've always had fear and I've never, I've always been super transparent. Anybody that's followed me, no, I'm very transparent about the process. Uh, but I think because our country, our society enjoys comfort, right? We want to be comfortable. We don't want to, any kind of discomfort we feel, we pick up the phone, we pick up the, we buy something, we call somebody like, you know, we don't understand how to just sit with ourselves. And if you start doing that, I promise you, you will start to have more agency over yourself. Uh, yeah, it's true. And it's like you said, you know, uh, people are afraid to engage their dreams. And again, I think that it ties into, uh, aside from the critical inner voice, it, it, it ties into the fact that a lot of us were raised in a generation where our parents our primary caregivers and the people within our communities and the adults within our communities were not necessarily mindful yeah. of the psychological impact that their choices, their behaviors, their words, their criticism had on influential children. And so yeah. we quickly adopt the same way of talking, the same way of, of, of regarding our peers. And then without even knowing it, that voice that hurt our feelings when we are 12 takes precedence over everything else every single time that we get an idea um, because yeah. we don't want to be the laughing stock. We don't want to be whatever we were at the age of seven or 10 or nine or five or three that mm -hmm. feel that, that level of vulnerability and keeping it 100. You're just basically letting a child govern your life at that point. And I have a little theory, which is that one of the reasons that that fear is so prominent is one because we haven't identified it. We're not even aware that we're carrying that. That we're not even. We haven't even identified the root of the fear. In fact, there's a guy. His name is uh, Doc Doctor Eric Meisel. He said that as long as you hold it sensible to critique yourself, you will continue to do it. There's like an inertia. So as long as you you hear the critical inner voice and you're like, oh, that's cool, yeah, that's cool. I, I get it. I get it. You will continue to do it. The key. Is to actually confront it, yes. like you, sh you know, like if had someone mindful been present and been like, "Whoa, you can't talk to Junior like that. What is wrong with you? Do you understand the impact that that has on a seven-year-old child?" If some, you've got to be that person now. And so, which, and the reason it came to mind, Doctor Meisel came to mind, is because it leads me to something, a philosophy that I have, which is that how we be, how we adopt our 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 survival personality, meaning at some point in our lives, we were convinced that we were not enough as is. It usually happens very early. It could be as early as three, five, 10, is we then begin to behave the way that we think we should. Mm -hmm. And usually we're, right? And we're, we're choosing that behavior for acceptance. We're choosing that behavior to avoid ridicule, right? But it's not our most authentic being. But as you, be, as you take on the survival personality, the raw, authentic, seven-year-old you ends up getting left back there yeah. doesn't get coached doesn't doesn't have someone taking up for them doesn't get the the nurturing uh uh, res, uh the nurturing and, and and the resolve so we're not even aware that we left ourselves back there yeah so what ends up happening is the vulnerability or the fear that or the trauma that we experience in that period we interpret it the same throughout our adulthood. And so we're actually being governed with a seven-year-old's emotional intelligence. So the key, in my opinion, is to go back and talk to that seven-year-old. Explain to that seven-year-old why you left in the first place. Mm -hmm. And explain to that seven-year-old why that seven-year-old doesn't have to be afraid anymore because you are going to protect that seven-year-old mm -hmm. and explain to that seven-year-old everything that you're learning in the process of getting to a point of feeling healed. Yeah. And I've done this. I know it sounds crazy. I literally go from chair to chair. Me as the seven-year-old, next chair, me as myself. I've done this. Um, and I've, I've read about it in books. There's a great book on, 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 on male depression written way back in the day by Dr. Terrence Real titled, I Don't Want to Talk About It damn good book. And in that book, he had a lot of his male clients who'd been through much more traumatic stuff than me do those exercises. Um, and so anyway, I would just encourage everyone to consider trying to figure out where you left that, that, that inner child and go console that inner child, nurture that inner child and bring them along with you on this journey. 
Yeah, that's good. Another good book too is Healing the Inner Child. Uh, mm. And it, it talks about what Rami said about actually talking to yourself and as that inner child and telling that inner child that it's okay. Because some of that, some of the times that voice that there, that critic, you know, we can look at it another way and say it's protecting us because at some point in our lives, it protected us to stay in a certain lane to be okay. She's you right. Know? That's a hundred. Yeah. And that now we're adults, but we all, we tend to feel stuck, right? But feeling stuck and being stuck are two different things. And until you face that inner child, that critic, that noise, you're mm -hmm. always going to find yourself in that position being governed by your inner child. Something that was really interesting as we're talking about coming from a culture, you, people talk about, oh, this cancel culture, we got to get over this. Cancel. What about the fact that we all grew up in shaming culture, right? I never forget this. A director came to me when I was filming, I was doing a movie called St. John of Las Vegas. It was with Steve Buscemi, me and him. And the director said to me, there are two kinds of people. There's the clown and there's the buffoon. And the buffoon, his humor is at the expense of others. And the clown, his humor is at his own expense. The joke is always on the clown. And in that minute, I was like, I don't want to be a buffoon. And I don't think I've made fun of anyone since. Um, and so my point being is that ask yourself, do you want to be a clown or a buffoon? Which one do you think behooves you? Which one do you think is more beneficial to your community, to your children, to your household? And once you've gotten a clear objective of what you'd like to be, be mindful of that and practice that. And that will really also help with this critical inner voice. Uh, so this was good. Anybody that's listening to this, you know, uh, and you feel that anything speaks to you, you know, one of the tools that he started off talking about is mindfulness and a great way to start practicing mindfulness, grab a notebook, start writing down um, your thoughts, how you're feeling. I think feelings and uh, turn into, uh, thoughts turn into our feelings, feelings to behavior. So a lot of the things that you're not doing it's because of the feelings, but everybody knows feelings change all the time. Uh, so definitely like start to do that. I think that that would help tremendously. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the sad thing is, is that a lot of us are governed by our emotions. But the sadder thing is, is that a lot of us have not em matured emotionally. That's immature guidance that we've yeah. surrendered to. And when it really boils down to it, pretty much everything you want in life really boils down to a few things. And one of them is just action steps. That's all I do and, is action. Yep. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and persistence, like you have to be consistent and it's like those things require sacrifice because there are times when you're going to wake up and you're not going to feel like doing it. Yeah. There are going to times when it, when that step is really scary yeah. Um, it's going, it's going to hold you accountable in ways where you're going to have to figure out how to manage your time to make it all work so that you're not neglecting your family in the process of pursuing your dreams, but you have yeah. to sacrifice something. It's, it's also <clears throat> being confident enough or willing enough to even declare what you want yeah. to even just say that this is what I want. I still mm -hmm. struggle with that, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, uh, I will definitely say that journaling, as Celeste had mentioned, has definitely helped with that. And another thing that's really helped with that, which is probably which practically impossible now because of these things right here, but stillness. It's Literally not impossible. Just, that, don't don't give people that because it's like what we allow. You just no, no, get on your phone, right? It's not impossible. It's a choice to get on your phone. Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm keep it real. People act like it's impossible. I should just say that. But okay. it's not. It's a priority. You're right. Yeah. You disconnect from all of this stuff and yeah. sit still yeah. in silence. If you can give yourself that luxury, you don't have to assume any discipline or any posture, but you can sit still in yeah. silence. The most advanced technology will, pro will begin to speak to you. Yeah. And that's your intuition. And I'm the best way I can put it is when you finally quiet the brain, you can hear what the mind is saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the mind is kind of like all knowing. So all the unresolved issues and things that you've learned to pack down and almost forget about, the mind can help you 
identify those things, gain insight from in ways that you might not have prior in those periods of stillness. Yeah. And I'm going to just throw this out there though. I want y'all to hear it. I swear to you, I had the type of a negative internal dialogue when I was like 29, 30, that had me feeling like I couldn't shut it off. Like it had me feeling like I was on the verge of, of falling into like real mental illness. And I went to a therapist and two sessions with the therapist, not that she was great or anything. She kind of, every time I bought up something, she kind of bought it back to about something she was going through in her life. Shit. Um, but what was cool, <laughs> right? And that's the real talk. But what was cool is just that experience alone shut off 35, 40% of the negative internal dialogue in my head. And I'm going to tell you why. Because that was my first experience of realizing I could sit down, be vulnerable, speak openly about my flaws and mistakes that I had made, right? In a professional environment and not have to think about being shamed, not have to think about any of it. Mm -hmm. That's when, I'll tell you earlier on in my life, earlier on in my life, I when I was a kid, I had learned it. Oh, wow. When I find ways, like if I can like crack a joke, right, about something going on in my house that our lights got cut off, right? So people making fun of my clothes and I might say something like, man, back in those days we wore Kangos. I'd be like, man, I ain't wear my, I ain't wear my Kango today and my leather jacket because our lights got cut off. I couldn't find it, right? <laughs> people be like, that's funny, ha, ha, ha. But you know what, dude, we got our lights cut off, for, you know, and yeah. people open. I, that's how I learned it. But as it matured, the mature version of that was being able to sit across from someone and say to them that I feel incredibly insecure about, uh, you know, uh, my ability to be consistent in relationships. I don't, I have a, an issue with trust. Um, I, I, I feel incredibly inadequate. And the, the inner critic in me is going, ain't, ain't, ain't nobody gonna shame this motherfucker. <laughs> Y'all ain't gonna crack no jokes. And when I sat in that room and realized that that was, that was, that existed, that a, a safe place, 40% of that inner, inner, inner critic Oh. Was shut down 30, 30, 35, 40%. And then from that point, so I just want to say to people if you can find, I'm not saying it has to be therapy, it could be counseling from anywhere, but if you can, or support from friends and family, but if you can find environments, if you can create environments for yourself where that is possible, I believe that there's, I believe that there's, the, there's a lot of benefit to it in, in silencing that. And it's a great step in the direction of silencing that inner critic. Mm hmm. I just want to take one question because it's an interesting question. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think the inside voice ever offers constructive criticism? I personally think that that inside critic doesn't necessarily have to even be interpreted as a critic. It could just be that inside voice. And I think that what, what, what we're talking about here is being able to distinguish between the this inner critic, which is negative internal dialogue, and our intuition and our intuition. So how do we distinguish between our conditioning and our intuition? That's the challenge. That's the whole thing that we're talking about here. And that conversation that we just had about being still and allowing yourself to listen to the mind is a great step in the direction of being able to distinguish between the two. Okay. So negative internal dialogue is very different from intuition. Perfect. I love it. You know, I can't let you leave without talking to you about your movie. Oh, um, right. Purpose Over Prison. So I'm going to just uh, show the trailer. Mm -hmm. I just believe that if you're going to be a life coach, you got to be a life coach 247 because life is a full time job. Why do you always got to speak in parables? You know, I'm going to need travel permits once this they go. I think about it. What you mean you going to think about it? Do you need me to speak in parables too? I'm going to just follow my call and be a motivational speaker. Last I checked, you were the subject of a 10 minute student film, not the Green Mile. You can't get this kind of respect unless you achieve that. Have you contacted your family? Y'all kidding, right? My fans are probably waiting for me outside right now. They be here. I just bought a new one. What up, mama? I know you didn't bring these cameras, but you... This is my room. Not anymore. Oh, you smell like Michael Moore. Being TJ's PO is frustrating. He had a lot of potential, you know, but he staked on some stupid... Have I ever one time missed one of your debates? Yes! 
because I was in jail, right? How much they pay for your little life story? That's classified. As of today, I'm strictly on my billionaire grind. I denounce that petty hustle. Hey, y'all got y'all got some change. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna build my motivational company from the flow up to the blow up and get my dough up. Oh. Hey, take, you can take that thing out. They can edit that out. He ain't perfect. He's trying. Yeah, that's for you. Uh, you ain't still anything. Mm. Well, the pain should be the pathway to your purpose. Don't seek success. Seek purpose and let success find you. Desired position. Doggy <laughs> style. What? No, sure. No, I'm, you play too I'm much. Sure. No. Oh, pull out, pull out. no, you fill it up. Ah, that that was uh tell tell people about it, that um yeah you want you want to talk about fear that, <laughs> there you go um yeah that movie's called Tijuana Jackson Purpose of a Prison it's on iTunes Google Play Amazon Voodoo Fandango you can go to tijuanajackson.com and get all the skinny but that's a character I've been doing online for 10 years and um making a movie you know definitely pulled me out of my comfort zone because it, i was asked to direct it write it and star in it i ended up editing it as well it's a little independent film i did a crowdfunding campaign to raise the money for it used the crowdfunding campaign to attract investors it's this long process and in, and there are no guarantees that it's ever going to come to fruition and just consistently going despite being blind despite not seeing any light at the, at the end of the tunnel just being this dark road where you're kind of on it for a long time all by yourself and then one day the movie comes out and it's sitting in the top three comedies on itunes amidst this covid19 um madness and everybody's hitting you up and congratulating you and in your dms and asking you to send them a link and um it's a damn good feeling it's a damn good feeling. Congratulations. Um, thank you. It stars Tammy Roman, Regina Hall, uh, Alcoya Brunson, um, Bajalyn Odom from Ruthless. It's a good film. I mean, it's a good little independent film. It's not like a big studio film where you can have all the big set pieces. It's more so uh, like a, a genuinely, a genuine, honest, uh, independent film. And I'm I'm proud as hell of it. And if you look, wherever you go, if, if, if you can rate it on a five-star system, it's rated five stars across the board. Um, I think the lowest rating it has out of five is like 4.3. Because people, it, you know, like I said, it's, it, the, the character's crazy. So people either love the hell out of it or, or are pissed off by it. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having that ready. Let people know how they can find you. Yeah, just go to RomneyMalco.com and everything is there. Yeah, if you go to RomneyMalco.com, you can't miss it. it. Links to whatever social media platforms. Actually, can I keep it 100? I want everyone to do me a favor. Go to Pep Pager Light. That's oh, L-I-T-E in Google Play in the App Store. Pep Pager Light. Follow me on the Pep. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I get so many people complaining that they're not getting notifications when I go live or when I post a video or whatever the case is. I decided I would just notify them myself. So I created a notification app called the PEP. If you, It's called PEP Pager Lite, L-I-T-E. If you want to see what a, what a black man's app looks like, go to Google Play or the App Store and download it. Follow me on there. And you'll get notifications when I'm going live. You'll get notifications when I give stuff away. You'll get notifications when I so like uh, post videos. Oh, this is this is my page. If you go there, you can find my page. Yay, yes. Oh. If you look into all the different algorithm changes and policy changes that have occurred over the behemoth of social media, talking about YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what you notice is, is that a lot of times small businesses will build their followings, build their, their audiences to a certain degree, and a lot of their livelihood will rely heavily on their ability to communicate effectively with those audiences. And then a simple change in policy will disconnect them from 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of their income. Yeah. And to me, that spoke to me in this way. Well, then the future of social media is that first, you you take ownership of your following and then you direct that following to what platforms you'd like them to follow you on. So that's what the pep is. The pep or the or pep pager light is basically you having the direct connection with your audience 
first. And once you have that direct connection with your audience, they get an option to let the pep know what platforms they follow you on. And then when you send out notifications, they're, they're notified. And so what that does is when you get a notification in the pep, what the, what it does is that notification and you tap that notification, it takes you directly to the post. So you're not scrolling through the drama. You, you're not being exploited. You're not being, your behavior isn't being tracked. You get to watch that, whatever that post is, and then you go right back. You go right back to the app as opposed to having to scroll through all the noise, all the advertisements and have your behavior tracked. You're just basically operating more directly with your audience and more directly with the post or the influencer that you choose to follow. It's free. So for small businesses and whatnot, just go on and use it. It's the people's empowerment platform. The PEP is the people's empowerment platform. It's free. Go use it. It's an experiment. Maybe it works for you. Yes. And and I'll, I'll have the link to mine's in there as well. And, you know, uh, on my episode one, so we're, this is episode 267, episode one. I give Romney a shout out on episode one of Celeste Therapist podcast, because before uh, I created this platform, I would follow him on Periscope. He always talked about creating your own platform. I was like, I got Periscope. I have this. And he would, I, he would just talk to the audience. He wasn't talking directly to Celeste. He was just talking to the audience. I was mm -hmm. taking notes mm -hmm. and uh, I said, well, damn, I need to start my own platform. And so the platform was created because of listening <laughs> to him talk about the importance of creating your own platform. So now I'm always talking to people about creating their own platform because of you. <laughs> no, thank you. And it's great. And you know, listen, whether we want to or not, I feel like the United States of America is finally catching up to the rest of the world. And me being someone of Caribbean descent, look, having, having three, four, five side hustles is a way of life. It's always been. Mm -hmm. And so now that we are all kind of expected to take on some entrepreneurial role in order to supplement the income that we may not be getting, especially in COVID-19 time era. It's important to know that you risk losing whatever rapport you build with your audience if you rely solely on social media for that uh, for that connection. If, if you're at all an entrepreneur, small business owner, it's key. And there are other apps you can use. There's something called Community um, actually, there's one called uh, Superphone.io where you can do text messaging with your audiences. The reason that you don't hear me speaking up uh, email much anymore is because when you really think about the click-through ratios of email, it's not as effective as it was. Most people give you a fake email anyway. They're giving you a throwaway email. But when you think of the click-through ratios, if you're selling beauty products, you're averaging somewhere between a 3 and 5% click-through of people who actually open your email. If you're more official, coming from government, finance, that kind of thing, you get a higher click-through, maybe like anywhere between, on average, you get 15% of those people opening your email. But of the 15% or of the 3, point, or three to 5% that actually open your email, 1% to 2% actually click on any links in the email. So really you probably getting the same kind of turnout from you probably getting the same kind of turnout from social media now if you really curate that list and you really have people who are genuinely interested in what you have to offer genuinely interested in what you have to say then you can obviously outperform that my my i do i have like a 27% open rate and somewhere in like 15 to 18% people clicking on the links but that's because my audience follows me for a very specific thing. So I would just say it's important also to understand that the cool thing about the PEP is text messaging and emails are invasive. That's why people give you fake email addresses. <clears throat> and so having the PEP, it's just called a PEP pager light because it's just a pager. Literally, you just receive a, note, a buzz and it's like, oh, look, Celeste posted something. Let me see what it is. Takes you directly to the post. And when I'm done with the post, I make my comment or whatever, and I go right back into the app and proceed to see what other notifications I have. Bam. Just like that. Bam. <laughs> Thank you, Rami, for everything. Thank you. Very appreciated. Yeah, I appreciate it, you being here talking to the audience. Uh, and dropping is, yo, yo, you're doing so well, and it's so impressive. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Have a blessed one, and thank you for having me as a guest, Celeste. Seriously. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye, Rami. Bye. How do you tune out? I'm tuning you out. I'm getting you off. Okay, okay.
Uh, all right, so that's a wrap. Uh, that was Rami uh, speaking about a little bit of everything. That's what he does. He's a jack of all trades. Um, so thank you guys so much. We'll be back Monday. Uh, follow, yes, I'll follow you. So yeah, follow me on the pep. Uh, my mom says, well done. <laughs> she... <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> I think this is the first live podcast she, she uh, came in. Uh, so, uh, thank you guys so much for rocking out with me. I appreciate you. You know, if anything that we ever say resonate for you, understand that you have the power to make the change. You just have to have, you know, faith to believe in yourself. Um, and it starts with mindfulness. I think that's such an important thing to start with. Uh, follow me, celestetherapist.com, uh, on all social media platforms, follow the podcast. I'll see you guys Monday talking to somebody else who's doing something to empower the lives of others. Smile, every hug, every kiss, every touch, every person in my life that I care about and love away. Maybe I'm getting too emotional. Maybe. That's exactly what they say you ain't supposed to do. Why? Suppress your feelings, never talk about your pain. Can't appreciate the sun without acknowledging it rains, right? That's right. So this a moment of clarity. Clear. And make sure you always protect your energy. Yeah. You stay focused and your life goes